This is mercy and I a good son. You are my father, so never alone. This isn't pity as cold as a gun. Not a word will be written. Not a word will be written. This isn't a chisel pressed to a stone. This isn't pity as cold as a gun. You are my father, so never alone. Let this be mercy and I a good son. My father, Frank, was from Silesia, which is in Poland, but had been in Germany before the war. When he was 14, he was conscripted into the Hitler Youth and then later the German army. The consequences of not joining would have been terrible for him and his family. He fought at Monte Cassino and was captured in Italy. He ended up in the Polish Free Army and, like many Poles, came here after the war. He kept his German army pass a secret. Elizabeth June was a scouser. During the war she was evacuated to Shrewsbury to a kind and well-to-do family who gave her a taste for the finer things. When she was 17 she met and fell in love with my father Frank and wrote him love letters from her room in Liverpool. My darling Frank, I bought a dream of a coat darling, a loose one in Gabardine. I owe Mum the money out of her insurance, but I will pay it back, and besides, I had to have a loose coat. June stands on the bedroom lino, wraps her gabardine coat around her, lets the wardrobe mirror take her dreams and turn them silver. We didn't go to the pictures over the weekend, not that I missed the films, but I could have rested my head on your shoulder and schmoozed a little. Passport to Pimlico flickers onto the silver screen and June is lost to her own country. They are king and queen on thrones of velvet. Stars swirl above their heads. They turn to each other and kiss and kiss. If I had the money, I would catch a train to Shrewsbury tonight. Frank, darling, I love you so much, it is impossible to wait 12 months. I just can't do it, darling. I want you to ask Mum again, and if she says no, break it to her gently. We are going to apply to the magistrates. June reaches a white gloved hand across the refreshment room table. They don't notice the rain outside, nor the other couples parting and meeting. He tells her again, with that dark accent, that he loves her. And it's like her heart has stopped, like nothing could be forbidden. I want it to be nice to go to bed with our curlers. We can pretend we are married. There is only enough moonlight for the shape of him. She learns by touch. Afterwards, her head spills black curls onto his chest. The sound of their breathing fills the room. I still want a peach, but I have no hope of getting one. There, in the middle of a white plate, in the middle of the table, a peach in the glow of its own light. It's for her, and Harry got it, he will never tell. Only say that in China it is the name given to a young bride and a symbol for everlasting life. I shall keep the house nice and have the water ready for your wash and have your clothes ready to change and your slippers by the fire. While you're getting washed and changed, I can have your tea on the table. A whole day slips through the pale purple of mansion polish. A carpet sweeper chases specks of dust through lavender fields. Her own face appears in the furniture. She shines small brass animals back to life. A tiny kitchen disappears into the mist of an afternoon. A sponge cake rises behind the oven door. He watches the last slow hour on the factory clock. We can nurse baby for half an hour, and then you must put him to bed. I insist on this. I want him to know his daddy as much as me. He must grow up to love us equally. We must give him a good life, so we will be proud of us. My mother calls me to the world from the thud of my hidden room. A gush of water, the muscular push. I am a boy, skin slick as celluloid. My first focus, an iris, an aperture dilating, a click. Everything is light. And that light was my father's flash gun. His camera was to record everything this perfect family did. And it was a perfect family now, 
because there was a son. Yes, there'd been a girl first, but a boy was the child imagined in the letters. A boy to parade in a silver cross pram. A pram in which a boy, me, could be admired. A pram from which he could survey the world in which he was to be told from as early as he would remember that he was going to be a doctor. The boy for whom the Arthur me encyclopedias were to be bought. For some reason, my sister Sue wasn't always kind to me. <laughs> Tonight, the click, click, click of stilettos on the pavement sound like rattlesnakes in your sock drawer if your sister tells you that's what she put in there. I send for mother with a howl. She lifts me to the window, shows me the high-heeled ladies passing by. After she's gone, I hear my sister hissing behind the door. During the day, though, my sister was at school and I was safe from her. But I wasn't safe from my mum dressing me up and sculpting my hair into a spectacular wave. She told me I looked like Cliff Richard, <laughs> as if that was a good thing. A good thing. <laughs> I can be trusted on my own for a few minutes. First off, a big spoon of Andrews in a glass, followed by orange squash and water, instant pop. Then the loaf and carving knife. Cutting soft white bread isn't easy when you're four, but you do your best. Two ragged door stops. Rewrap the bread and put the knife back exactly where you found it. Drag the bread across the margarine a couple of times. Pick off the crumbs. Thump ketchup into the middle of one slice. Put the other on top and move them around. You don't want washing up. Leg it up the garden before mum returns from the shop. Gobble down the butty behind the shed, then stroll back in through the kitchen door as cool as you like. Don't blink when she takes her hanky and wipes the sauce from the corner of your mouth. You'll have gathered from those letters that my mother eagerly took on her role as homemaker. She even had a signature dish. As its representative on earth, she places the lemon meringue onto the cloth, its perfect roundness and snowy peaks. She divides it up with the cake knife, cuts through the sweet crust into the bright tartiness beneath. We devour it, lick every last crumb from around our mouths, leave a shining, empty plate. On trips back to Liverpool, she would go and have her hair done in the same salon as Scylla Black's mum. Well, darling, I can't say whether or not I like my hair. It would certainly need a few days to settle down. It's certainly very curly. She was proud of her appearance and ours. Nobody was allowed to leave the house anything less than immaculate. And she often wore a hat and white gloves on outings. And the house mattered too, of course. She saved coupons from cornflake packets for a cutlery set. And on those trips back to Liverpool, she would research prices for further home improvements. I found a place near Mum's that sells toilets complete for £8 and wash basins and pedestals for £5.19 and six. Nice ones too. The only thing is he can't deliver. This particular suite is sold at Lewis's and would cost £17.06 for the toilets and wash basin, so check the prices at Shuka's, as the above doesn't include the toilet seat, and if Shuka's are dearer, then the girl said perhaps we can order one from here and get Philip to deliver it. It was our father's job to turn our house into a little palace. His greatest achievement was the building of a, of a fireplace. Father taps in each careful stone to the satisfaction of the spirit level. We place icons on its mantelpiece. In return for warmth, it demands fuel. So each night, Father takes to his knees and makes offerings of sticks and coal. He becomes our fire god, takes the vinyl armchair as his throne, sits there nursing the jawbone of an ass. On nice weekends, 
we go for walks along the river or we get a bus to local beauty spots like Church Stretton. When it rained, we sometimes built model aeroplanes together. Dad covers the table with newspaper while I rattle back from the shop, the airfix kit jumping in its box. We spread out the 122 black plastic pieces, match them to the tissue paper plan. The little man is stuck to his seat and the whole thing built around him, rough edges carefully sandpapered away. He sits there now, his painted on face, lost behind windows, clouded grey by our blue fingerprints. At school, I was found to have a particular talent for numbers, something even my arch-rival, the red-headed Jane Spray, couldn't beat me at. I am a sharp yellow seven, prime and primary. I already know numbers of the law. My classmates drown in the five times table while I race on in my head. Five seventeens at eighty-five. Six seventeens are one hundred and two. <laughs> With this came expectations. My father had plans for me. If you're going to be a doctor, then you need to have a proper pen. At W. H. Smith, in a ceremony of the utmost gravity, my father and the girl behind the counter bestow the pen upon me. It rests on my palm, marble barrel, fully loaded. Black quink ink, when released from its bottle, will seep into your skin through the pockets of your new school shorts, or else mark you up for fingerprinting before flying across the classroom in a wadge of blotting paper. Nibs suffer when gouged into desk splits, splayed and bent, they tear at exercise books, scratching out spelling mistakes. We all know that a pen should be kept in your pencil case, in your satchel, but at time, for convenience, you will leave it on a wall or else stuff it in your pocket so later it can slip out onto a bus seat if it hasn't already fallen into the grass during a handstand. By the third purchase, all the pomp has gone from the ritual. My father carries out the transaction in quiet disappointment. Even the girl at Smith's is exasperated. <laughs> On the bus home, it's explained how carelessness could one day cost a patient their life. <laughs> By the second week, the idea that you have no homework is becoming difficult to sustain. <laughs> Parents aren't stupid and Teachers aren't stupid and very soon they're going to get together on this. Of course, if one or both of your parents were to die in a terrible accident, then the small matter of homework would be forgotten. No one would mind if you asked for a new pen. Education was very important to my father and he paid for me to have piano lessons. And every Sunday I would be shut in the front room to practice in case I was Chopin. <laughs> I wasn't Chopin. <laughs> he would also try and teach me German from a Teach Yourself German book. Every few days he would take the book, yellow and blue, down from the shelf and put its words in my mouth like a hook. He started with numbers, ach, zen, self, hoping I'd recognise the taste find in it something of myself. I explored the shape of them, traced my ancestry with the tip of my tongue, sucked their coating of sticky almond paste back into my throat where it clung. Act, 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 neither swallowed nor spoken, remained unsung. My father hadn't been able to cross the Iron Curtain and visit home in Silesia since the war. And he missed more than the language. Sometimes he comes home with Polish sausage and a heart from another time and place. He serves it up with pickled cabbage. The journey here was no easy passage, a dismantled life thrown down a staircase. Sometimes he comes home with Polish sausage. There are certain kinds of knowledge time and distance can't erase. He serves it up with pickled cabbage. 
Exiles don't pack their own luggage. There's dead weight in every suitcase. Sometimes he comes home with Polish sausage. Snapshots have kept him hostage. His story frayed like a bootlace. He served it up with pickled cabbage. He's had to learn another language. Wear it like a different face. Sometimes he comes home with Polish sausage. He serves it up with pickled cabbage. My reluctance to learn German may not have been mere idleness. Like most boys of that time, I was obsessed by the war. All our games revolved around it. And this must have been strange for our fathers who lived through it, but were the heroes of our games. And what father doesn't want to be a hero to their son? The Germans were the villains. As fathers stroll home from work, there is no bird song, and the November light is all but gone. Small boys run amok in avenues, take cover behind privet hedges, the smell of cordite heavy in the air. Over the traffic, the sound of battle, grenades whistling overhead, the sporadic rattle of toy guns from doorways. At tea time, those whose turn it is break cover, make a zigzagging run for it, shouting, Achtung, Achtung. They go down in a hail of bullets, competing for the most dramatic death. The pavement is so littered with Germans, the men must pick a way through to reach their gates and take their sons down paths into quiet houses. By 1963, it was possible for him to visit home. A wife and three children, then you can visit. It's 20 years and there are still bomb holes in the road. You bring back Polish crystal for the cabinet, brass inlaid wooden boxes and a tankard carved out of coal. You take a thousand photographs, one of a fallen horse being flogged, not making a sound. The journey was three days and he took me with him. It included the excitement of a boat crossing and night train. Halfway between my father's birthplace and mine, I stand on the edge of a platform as the night train swallows me up in steam and noise. I can taste fire. In Berlin, we're woken by floodlights. Soldiers with machine guns come aboard, open compartment doors and check papers. I hold on tight to my man from uncle membership card as we cross into the east. The train stops in the middle of nowhere. We climb down to our suitcase in the grass, wave until the train disappears. The lane is lined with cherry trees. From time to time, we rest on the bank, side by side like partisans, our eyes closed into crimson. We eat cherries as warm as blood, spit the stones over our heads. At the farmhouse, geese and piglets chase me, squealing through the trees. Later, on hard benches, we sit and eat, and the talk goes on above my head in Polish. I can hear and smell cattle through a slatted wooden door. The dog's bowl, a German helmet, clatters on the stone floor and is licked clean. Push, push, Omar's bony hands make space in the tram for us. I spend the journey in the dark, lost in black dresses and the smell of cabbage. At the other end, all women spill out and race up the church steps like beetles. On the last day, I bought a watch with 17 jewels. My father puts it in my blazer pocket, tells me to keep it there until the end of the journey. Only then can I set it going, feel its heartbeat, check my pulse. While he's there, he learns more about how his family suffered at the hands of the Germans and then the Russians. Silesia has always been a disputed territory, and it's where Auschwitz is. Parts of it are very heavily industrialised and polluted, and I do remember us walking past the coal slag heaps. Cabins of fire growl deep underground, crack open the contaminated surface so the murmur of voices can escape. The bones of dukes and peasants, bohemians, prussians, mongol raiders and moravians are pressed tight into a fault line as thin as a flag. The flag is the colour of blood cells. Behind the buckling crosses of window frames, old men are dismantling clocks on kitchen tables, 
looking for providence amongst the cogs and spiders. And the black hills will join the sky and rain will pour down and bury this place. When he returned home, a new worker had started at the factory who recognised him from the German army. And so his secret was out. He started to have paranoid episodes. Things begin to unravel. You're all I've ever wanted since I was 17. No matter what you say or think, I've never been attracted to another man since. Just remember, I love you now and always and hope you'll learn to trust me once again. Believe me, darling, you've nothing to doubt me for. Words pour like chemicals into his burning throat. His head becomes a swaying thurible, incense smoke seething through his teeth. She is a Protestant. She is unfaithful. She is poisoning me. She is Protestantist. She is true loss. She burgeth tech myth. She is a Protestant. She is unfaithful. She is poisoning me. She feeds him eyes until his stomach aches. They grow claws and tongues, climb his spinal cord, scrape at the inside of his skull. They argue in the kitchen while we sit just the other side of the door, listening. And we still go on family outings, though, and he still takes photographs, careful constructions of an ideal family. He develops them, crouched under the stairs with me on his knee, watching the images appear. My mother and I pose in Sunday best in front of a cottage with roses around the door. She dreams it is our house where white gloves will not be smudged or snagged on a thorn and left with a pinprick of blood. I could print this photograph so dark there would only be her hand on my shoulder. I feel as though half of me is missing. How can you ever think I don't want you? God alone knows. My heart has been breaking these past months, wanting you to be mine again as you used to be. In my parents' bedroom, the curtains burn with distant fires. The ceiling is blank sky, the wallpaper a rose garden. The dressing table's arms are full of fallen objects, its mirror dumb. Through the wall, it causes no more than a ripple on the surface of milk. My toy soldiers are stilled, and I dream on, not of a pale throat, a kitchen knife. Jar McCord pulled tight. The whole thing tips upside down at the news. Cups and saucers spin away, disappear into the infinite Artex swirl. I am in the middle of the room, equidistant not just from the walls but the floor and ceiling too. I begin a slow, shadowless rotation through the silence. Heads are planets, the doctor's few thin hairs, the rings of satin. Uncle Alan is the ginger sun, my sisters and I, small lost moons. Auntie Margaret's cloud cover, Uncle Philip's oil fields, Father Lightbound's black jacket shouldering its own milky way. We've been woken and taken to a neighbour's house. In the morning, Mum's brother Alan was there and her sister Margaret with Uncle Philip and the priest, of course. Later, the doctor arrived, sat us down and told us that there had been an accident and as a result, our mother was dead. Nobody mentioned our father and later that day, we left with Uncle Philip and Auntie Margaret for St. Helens. The rear window flickers into life as we pull away. The uncertain image of a boy on a bicycle appears. Behind him, a painted backdrop of the avenue, its sycamore trees and pebble-dashed houses. Piggots, Mitchells, Mrs Donnelly's with all its confiscated footballs, a poodle yapping at the fence. The children's games are caught in mid-air at the peak of their action. Uncle Philip turns onto the busy road. 
The boy pedals like mad to stay with us, but we stretch away, leave him stranded, disappearing. Then there is just white light and the loose flapping sound of a film end escaping its gate. Uncle Philip was a director at Pilkington's Glass in St. Helens, a short back and sides sort of chap. Sweating with the men in the jungle heat of the factory floor, a gob of glass fizzes through his coat and suit into the meat of his arm. The shock rushes through his veins, takes his shape and becomes cold to the touch. A volcanic shift in his landscape has begun. He takes to carrying a spoon to tip molten glass down the nape of his neck and into the gaps between shirt buttons. Soon this is not enough and he wades into its boiling fury. Now only his hands and head have skin. The rest of himself is hidden away under clothes buttoned up to his chin. So I planned a getaway. Mass passed me by in a daydream about running away to live in a cave, rabbit skins keeping me warm. Walking home from church, my shoes with the secret compass in one heel leave animal prints in the snow. You really do see stars in the sudden, sickening darkness of a bang to the head. It takes a while to work out what, if anything, is hurt. The taste of blood first, then a fierce wave of pain from a tooth through a lip. I am dangling like a puppet, Uncle Philip's hand on the collar of my navy blue Mac. Back in the house, it really begins to hurt. Meals were taken in the morning room. The family gather round the table, ready for the meal, which is me, trussed up at the ankles and wrists, cooked to a golden finish like a chicken. As head of the family, Uncle Philip sharpens a knife, carves slices of flesh from my thighs and deftly transfers them to oven-warmed plates. Now everyone is getting stuck into the broccoli and potatoes, they're pouring gravy, spooning stuffing from my ribcage. The boy who came down the helter skelter, bend after bend, has gone. Keep this last film dark and tightly rolled. Hold its tongue between your teeth. Spoil down bones and animal hides. It's twenty layers of celluloid. My mother visited me in my sleep. The harmonium wheezes as June summons its reedy voice. Her insistent foot works the pedal on one side follows another to explore the dim bedroom, brush over the sleeping boy's face. A polka dot veil shifts as she sings, Oh, breathe on me, O oh breath of God. The boy wakes, inhales morning air as invisible and familiar as the leaf. Still, nobody has mentioned our father, and so I ask. Auntie Margaret can't find the words, takes the tip of her index finger, places it onto her temple, and draws circles. Wearing a white raincoat and black tie, Figura sat calmly between two prison officers. He admitted manslaughter with diminished responsibility, and this was accepted by the prosecution. Dr. Wilson, in answer to Mr. Taylor, said that Figura had seemed confused, but he had answered his questions calmly. He said he asked Figura how he felt, and he replied, You know, there's been difficulty between us. I'm a Catholic, she is a Protestant. I have been unfaithful to her. She will not allow me to go to confession. In answer to Mr. Tony Hayes defending, Dr. Wilson said Figura first consulted him around two years ago when he'd complained of headaches and tummy trouble and he had thought that this condition had arisen because his wife was trying to poison him. There were scratch marks found on Figura's chest. Skin scraped from under June's white fingernails into a polythene bag. Skin under Frank's coarse chest hairs broken by scratch marks. Under his white shirt and black tie, stratum corneum, stratum spinosum, stratum basal. The nurse puts a gentle hand into the small of Frank's back, holds the other out, 
Palmer for him to take, whispers that she will leave. The fluorescent lights blur as Frank is spun away down the white corridor. Doors full of grinning faces flash past. The clapping gets faster and faster. The nurse's keys crash like a tambourine against her hip. People shout his name, slap him on the back as he passes. The ward is strung with bunting. Frank sits dizzily on the bed to read all the cards while coloured blues bob on ribbons from the window bars. This is quite a welcome. Crow-eyed nurses watch the faint echo of a man in six inches of bath water. Silver-white lithium drifts metallic through his bloodstream. The span of his hand in front of his face takes a low hum from his mouth, returns it as a pebble to his tongue for him to swallow, keep in the swim of his belly below the muffled drum of his heart with all the rest. The camera is inside a box, inside a box, inside a padlocked room, inside a warehouse. I imagine it imagines itself forgotten, left for dead in a town it wouldn't recognise, that maybe the town itself is forgotten, boarded up and windblown. The camera's thoughts are brittle and unresolved. One day I'll hold them with white gloves, carefully brush away the dust and look through their shadows and fingerprints. My sisters and I were dispatched to different boarding schools. I went to a Benedictine school in the Peak District where I was the only new boy. Curious boys nudge against me, jaws lined with small white teeth chew on bubblegum. The inevitable puncture of sickly air and I am wrapped in their membrane like a struggling pupa. Over the weeks I pick at it, roll it under my thumb into grey lumps, pull strands from my hair, drench my hands and arms in saliva, run them over my face and emerge in their image. The curious boys had wanted to know about me. I wasn't sure of the facts and so... I made stuff up. Did I fabricate a credible story? Of course I didn't. I was a nine-year-old boy. I think I stopped just short of Uncle Philip having a rocket ship. He did, in fact, have a humble super snipe. Shortly after I arrived, another boy's father died and a church service was held for him. This boy was smaller than all of us, his skin pale and dry <coughs> like his own breathing, no wonder his father died. We pray for him as solemnly as we can, hang our young, puzzled heads, screw our eyes tight shut. Afterwards, I stay behind and pour out my own fat tears onto the pew in front, where they gather to form a lake and then a waterfall spilling down to the stone floor, where they gather again, rise up the walls until the chapel becomes a bell, each tiny sound amplified the hiss of candles, my gulps for air as the altar cloth passes over me, my breath rising bubbles to the surface and breaks. Collecting me was a long round trip for Uncle Philip, and the journeys were quiet, so quiet that once, wary of breaking the silence by asking for a stop, I wet myself, and he stopped collecting me at half turns then, and the pocket money allowance they gave me would run out even before half term. And so I learned to fend for myself. Strange boy. We believe there is a one in ten chance the boy will inherit it from his father. The boy is top in maths. He's near the bottom of the class in everything else. He writes wild, imaginative essays with little regard for spelling or grammar. He cries easily. The boy's house number is Belmont 47, a prime number. We know he steals, but we're letting it go for now. We also know he smokes. He pulls a face when he concentrates. The other boys have noticed this. The boy is left here during the half-term break. He occupies himself with dice games of football or cricket that can take days to complete. They are too complex for anyone else to participate in. The boy maintains a number of statistical graphs. He is a good goalkeeper. 
He has made some friends through football. He has invented an elaborate past. He carries a 1966 to 67 News of the World football yearbook at all times. Father William lets him complete his pools coupon. He has had some small successes. Uncle Philip went to Expo 67, a trade fair in Canada, and the following year he accepted a job offer. The family left quickly, and I was just simply not collected from school at the end of term, and it was left to a baffled headmaster to investigate and find out why. Father Hugh closes his eyes to think how he might put it to me. I trace a line of cherryade over the white cloth with a straw. The icing on the bun is as pink as his round face. The cigarette rests on his lip. They've gone to Canada, he says, Uncle Philip and Auntie Margaret. I'll be going to the Vineyard Children's Home, Mulberry Cottage. I picture it with roses around the door, sweet dough sticking to the roof of my mouth. He stubs out his cigarette and lights another one. I could have had whatever I wanted. And so we never see or hear from Uncle Philip and Auntie Margaret again. And we just could not have been more thrilled. <laughs> to be fair, Auntie Margaret was my mother's sister. I must have dreaded that perhaps one day my father would turn up with a suitcase in his hand. All the same, they really don't come out of this story very well at all. And to protect them, I haven't used their real name, Eddie and Ethel. <laughs> Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, Auntie Margaret, Uncle Philip, God bless, for avoiding any awkwardness, for leaving just like that, for sparing yourselves the upset by getting school to tell us. Thank you, Auntie Margaret, Uncle Philip, God bless, for not troubling us with regret, for not giving comfort your address, for bothering to care less, for going to Canada on a jet. Thank you, Auntie Margaret, Uncle Philip, God bless. And so, for the next holiday, I went to the Vineyard Children's Home, where the boys were very different to those at the boarding school. For a start, one of them, Liz, was a girl, but because of her football skill and robust physicality, was accepted as an honorary boy. <laughs> we are, we are the vineyard boys. We all wear the same shit shoes. We have broken all our toys. We are, we are the vineyard boys. We are cuckoos. We are noise. We are, we are the vineyard boys. We are issues, rent boys, dole cues. We are, we are the vineyard boys. Mouth. A switch flipped in a pit of a stomach, a pointless point nit picked, an argument running amok, can of petrol in hand, a match being struck. Liz, centre forward at the park, queen of the toe poke and shoulder barge, Lady Madonna on Thursday nights, dances to top of the pops in black and white. Pie sucker, the sound of steak and kidney sucks through a hole, all gummy grin and gravy chin, he tags along on skinny legs of ringworm welts and midgy bites. Gonk, head butter, nutter, culprit, calflet, stole a stuffed bear from Woolies, legged it. Someone actually shouted, stop thief. He was cornered by the great British public. Paul went to the shop for tartan paint, stood for an hour while you fetched a long wait. One day he left in a car and he didn't come back. Martin, stuck up, too clever by half, doesn't fold his pyjamas, all boarding school, la -di da cake hole. Once a day for the benefit of a small crowd, he taps out a number six from a pack of ten, sticks it in his gob, shakes one huge hand against the wind, runs with a tube thumb down the lighter wheel, flings a par spark into petrol, into a flame, an intake of breath, the sulphur burn of white to grey, the hush of the crowd is in a single drag. He turns a whole cigarette to ash. We are, we are the vineyard boys. We all wear the same shit shoes. We have broken all our toys. We are, we are the vineyard boys. We are cuckoos. We are noise. We are, we are the vineyard boys. We are issues, rent boys, dole cues. We are, we are the vineyard boys. My sisters went to a nearby children's home. 
which also contained five feral Irish sisters. And my sister Sue asked me if I fancied Siobhan, who was the wildest and the prettiest. I said, no, I liked Maureen, who was the second prettiest, blushed easily and was much less frightening. <laughs> I went for Maureen in the hall of the Flora Dugdale home for laughing girls. Girls who take it in turns to peer around the door at the boy in the stifling yellow polar net. We flee blood-cheeked, turn the corner before we hold hands, catch our breath, speak. I take her to see John Lennon's psychedelic Rolls Royce. It rains. It rains so hard we are soaked and Maureen slips on the muddy verge. In the bus shelter, Maureen's tartan skirt stuck to our legs. Me fiddling with its silver safety pin. The lurch for a kiss. The taste of tree bore mints. Rain. Back at Mulberry Cottage, I overhear a Miss Page tell the other children that my sisters are common and that I don't even fold my pyjamas. And then she catches me smoking and I'm destined to spend the rest of that summer holiday weeding the verges. Luckily, there were the Piggots, a magnificent eccentric family and former neighbours. They found out where I was and they came and got me. There was a lot of them. Taken prisoner by this bashing, clouting clan, jammed between Danny and John, the second and third boys with their shock white hair and flying fists, dragged through lanes and hedges into ponds and up trees for birds' eggs, thrown into the gritty eyed dawn to pick mushrooms as big as dinner plates and damsons to, for damson jam, put to work with sandpaper on rusting scrap heap cars, flying over fields on the Honda 50 being chased by the mad dog, the mad dog burying bones in your bed hurling itself downstairs, sticking its head up women's skirts. Diana's look out while we skinny dip in the river Weaver, and once a water rat swam between us. Diane goes to the grammar. Billy crashed his Lambretta, Dennis Capri, went to Spain with his mates. Holidays on Shell Island, famous for its shells, pitching into the air from sand dunes, racing the tide, Screaming from cliff tops, hauling crabs from the sea on twine on pop bottles, diving into waves, digging a tunnel in the sand. Me, buried alive, recovering in the tent, strange orange light, listening to Day of the Triffids on the radio. Friday night with woodpecker cider, watching the Hammer horror film, falling asleep before the end. Weekends visiting family in terraced houses, everyone jammed into front rooms. Our Jeannie, our Gracie, Mooch, Auntie Annie and her Ian. The grown-ups smoking as if their lives depended on it. The girls hitting as hard as the boys. Auntie Alice's and Uncle Eddie's, their two lads playing Rolling Stones records upstairs. Homebrew in every cupboard, under the sink, in the glory hall, in the outhouse, in the greenhouse, in the wardrobe. Come and have a taste of this lad. Brown ale, bitter, brandy, marrow rum, Auntie Alice dolloping out steaming dinners that make your belly pop, altar boys on Sunday morning, then checkley for eggs and Cheshire cheese from Len, his boots by the fire, him talking slow, his sister Edie busy at the stove, home in Henry the big black car, tin tomatoes on toast in front of the telly, family parties at the drop of a hat, egg rolls and party cans, trifles and crisps, oaky cokies and terrible dancing to status quo, Auntie Lizzie's monologue, us boys trying for cool in market bought Ben Sherman's brogues and two-tone two -tone stay press, reeking of brutes, dancing with our cousins, Auntie Jane a little merry, hoiking a skirt right up her leg and shouting, look, half a knicker, three car brag and poker for pennies, Auntie Annie popping round next day on her moped for a chat, paint, we called him that, love watching the Aeneid in line, building dream boats in the garden, boozing in the Derby Arms, a room behind the shop. Sometimes he took us with him and told us stories about Australia, where Bill was born, where he drove oil tankers across the outback and didn't see another soul for days. Not even a mirage. Fix a pedal with a block of wood and fell asleep at the wheel. Once he tried to tell us the facts of life, but he couldn't. He reads Exchange and Mart and J.T. Edson books, a town called Yellow Dog, the lure of the gun, a horse called Mogolon. He lies under old cars and the new clothes best bought to smarten him up. He does what best tells him most of the time. Best rules us all with a tongue of iron, hands out advice, dishes out justice, hands out love, 
fights for us all, watches the telly with a silver cat on her lap, drinks ginger wine and smokes menthol cigarettes, likes green, lets anyone in the house for a cup of tea. One day I'll come home on leave and the taxi driver will ask me, what is that place? And so they kind of dragged me along. Best bought me my first long trousers and got me into Blessed John Shirt's secondary modern, where I failed the 11 plus more than once. This did not stop me wearing a genius badge, though, and refusing to remove it when told to by Miss Mitchell. It taunted her from my lapel for weeks, earning me some much-needed credit from my new classmates. I'm wearing it today, just a little more discreetly. <laughs> At home, though, I decided that if I was a good boy, then I'd be allowed to stay. I will be a good boy here. I promise I will never dawdle. I'll do as, do as I'm told. Have no fear. Be assured there is nothing queer about me. I will be no trouble. I will be a good boy here. I believe in all that you hold dear. Whatever it is, I will not quarrel. I'll do as I'm told. Have no fear of untidiness or dirt behind my ears. It's no longer my nature to be idle. I will be a good boy here. And now I'm in my second year, I will not lose my new school satchel. I'll do as I'm told, have no fear. And even though my brothers jeer, please call me your little angel. I will be a good boy here. I'll do as I'm told, have no fear. Meanwhile, Frank remained in Broadmoor, counting. Patience through a door, peas on a plate, knives, forks, spoons, keys on a belt, pills in a plastic cup, minutes in the day, 60 dormitory beds, heads on pillows, shouts in the night, the distance from your neighbour, monsters on the ceiling, therapeutic kicks, privileges, what is lost, nurses, jokes, bricks in the wall, the number of steps around the yard, jigsaw pieces, one small square of sky. Frank began to re-emerge understand where he was and what he'd done. Frank sits down straight back and stares ahead. He doesn't notice the TV's whine, nor the clatter of the table tennis. He opens his mouth and a beam of light comes out, cuts through the smoke and hits the blank wall opposite. A boy with a bicycle, boys behind school desks, one with a cross marked above his head, a soldier waving from a train, a bear in a zoo, a ship, Buckingham Palace, a young man in a pub with a girl, a wedding day, a baby in a silver cross pram, a worker in overalls, a children's birthday party, a first holy communion, a day out at the castle, a holiday, a pebble-dashed house. Bess took me and my sisters to visit him in Broadmoor, we travelled down the day before with all of the piggots and we slept in the minibus on the car park so we could see him first thing in the morning. Dad squeaks over the linoleum, scrapes back a metal chair and sits down at the formica table. He pushes a nicotine finger along the edge and back again, turns the embassy packet in the other hand over and over. Maybe what he needs to say, he can't not with those other people in the room. He talks rather hopelessly about us all being a family again, that he started to work in the hospital machine shop. Best Piggott got him a tribunal and he was moved from Broadmoor to Shelton Hospital, 30 miles from Crewe, where the Piggotts lived, and so visits became more frequent. After a while, he was allowed a job driving a forklift truck for Chucky Chicken and to visit us. Then eventually, he was given a masonette near to the hospital and release. After the car rounds the bend, Frank looks in the rear view mirror and there it is, following behind in a cloud of red brick dust. Later, he'll watch it from his window, its gothic walls and water tower. In time, he'll get used to its shadow, no longer need to draw its, its curtains or drown its murmurings with the radio. Frank found a community there, people with their own stories like Brenda. Brenda had been a bunny girl in her former life. Now she had a dog that demanded a walk as soon as it had the theme tune to Coronation Street. 
So they would walk it up to the park and they sit and talk while the dog went down the children's slide again and again. They looked out for each other and furnished their homes from church hall sales. Every second Saturday, scruffy men and some women placed bric-a-brac onto trestle tables with their fat hands. My father keeps a poker face, gets what he wants for a thrilling £3.50. He would have gone to a tenner. At home, he places the damn set onto the floor, plotted in even before he removes his jacket. A thumb over the left breast of the floor line on the album cover, he slides out the black vinyl, places the needle onto his reflection. It hisses. He stands in the middle of the room, umpire music, thumping through the soles of his feet, the open window, the smell of a pine forest. I'd left school at 15 and joined the army so I'd be independent and responsible for myself. And then I fell in love. The girl I'm going to marry sits with a cup of tea on her lap while Dad fusses over the gravy, peels the potatoes under the tap. She's good at small talk, admires what he's done with the flat, teases him about liking the flowers, asks where he bought his jacket. Later, She'll, he'll fetch the camera from the drawer in the wardrobe and poses on his sofa in case we never come back. And if she had said so, we never would have gone back. But she liked him and she even taught me to like him. On visits though, he would try and explain, always starting with, your mother was no angel, which is as far as I would ever let him get. So he never did get my forgiveness uh, because he never apologised which is how we left it. I throw a few crumbs and feel your weight as you snatch at my barbarous line. You mouth and mouth as if trying to explain. All I get is maggoty river breath, the guilt of your scales dull in the air. A thumbnail could easily split your soft underbelly, spill your guts. I give you back to the river, its current of brown water. My sisters cut off contact with him, but I never had that courage, and I suppose I did remain fond of him, his sheer tenacity, the fact that he'd gone on to salvage some sort of life. He'd got married again and gone to live in Germany, and towards the end there were a couple of false alarms which involved me driving over to spend the last few hours with him, only to arrive and find him tucking into beer and sausages and feeling much better now, thank you so one day, though, the call wasn't from him, and he'd gone. The undertaker plumped his cheeks, which pursed his lips. It was as if my father was about to whistle. A few years after he died, I got married again to a beautiful poet, Helen Ivory, who was from Luton. And although not long ago, Polish shops weren't that common, certainly not in Norwich, where we live. Every time we visit my wife's mother in Luton, I find myself scooting round the corner to the Polish shop. It has shelves of sauerkraut in jars and strings of sausages in a cabinet. Sometimes they don't make it home. I dip them into the jar of mustard as I drive and eat them cold. We revisited my childhood together, peered in at it from the outside. We walked up the cinder path at the back of the old house and the shed I remember my father building over 40 years ago was still standing and I wondered if that fireplace had survived. We weren't allowed to visit inside Broadmoor but we did go and walk the marshy ground around it. Dad's alma mater squats on a low hill at the end of a Berkshire lane. It watches the moor with its many eyes keep thoughts inside heads, inside rooms, behind walls, behind wire. A deer breaks from the gorse, shakes rain from yellow flowers. I remember being small. Suddenly, June catches her breath, wakes reeling from the vertiginous blurred curvature of the earth, its unappeasable distance where she hangs voiceless. Below, lines of silver slowly pull into focus. She sees three rivers. These rivers are survivors coursing through canyons of beasts and wild flowers like blood through veins. They carry her with them. This isn't a dream. Now, I often imagine my mother surviving, 
what her life could have been like, her taking centre stage at her 70th birthday party. Listen, the violin, the playing, playing your favourite waltz. On the dance floor, the accordionist is stamping his feet in time to your song. The singer, the singer, the singer has words for all your lost years. Take my arm, my arm, my arm. Seventy verses of wishes, seventy verses of ghosts. Let us step through these memorable stars and dance and dance and dance until we've covered the dawn with our footprints, left midnight alone in its room. Thank you very much. Thank you.